Will you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be holy and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today we enter our last Sunday of our summer series of Praising God, Our Maker, a series on creation texts. And as you heard our passage from John, this isn't necessarily a passage we would typically label as a creation text. Yet what new creation is being proclaimed today? As I was preparing for this sermon, I imagined all of us being there with Jesus, having traveled from town to town, over mountains and through villages. I was trying to put myself in the shoes of the disciples, for I would be like them. Two chapters beforehand, when we encountered the blind man, the disciples were more worried about the grounded possibilities at hand. They didn't have in mind the heavenly possibilities of resurrection and life. The disciples asked, what is the origin of his blindness? Focusing on the situational limitations at hand when Jesus, he had in mind the resurrective potential of this encounter. And as I imagine being there with Jesus, I understand the disciples who can only see the limitations of this encounter. For this man has been blind since birth. What restoration could even be possible? I imagined for this blind man that there's so many reasons to despair. For he's at the margins of society, a beggar, dependent on the kindness of others. He has valid reasons to despair, for there is no cure for blindness. Yet this one, this Jesus, encounters the blind man where he is, encounters the man who has reasons to despair with a reason to hope. I am the light of the world, says Jesus. And on this day, the blind man was healed and could see light. And I can imagine that if I was there, I would ask, who is this Jesus that is not limited to grounded possibilities at hand, but opens up the heavenly possibilities of resurrection and life? I would imagine being there shocked at the resurrective power of Christ, for in no way could I have imagined this outcome, the inbreaking of a restoration that seemed impossible. That this Jesus, who encountered one who had every reason to despair, encountered him with a reason to hope, with the embodiment of hope. And so when we get to our text for today, I continue to imagine us sitting with our Lord when we hear a messenger has arrived. It's information. Lord, he whom you love is ill. And it's from Mary and Martha, for Lazarus is really sick. Of course, this information is taken in, for Jesus has shown us he can heal. He has given sight to the blind. If he can heal a blind man, he could heal Lazarus. And I imagine saying to myself, he's ill. Let's get on the road. Let's do what we can to prevent any death any further illness. Yet Jesus tells us we're staying two days longer. This is perplexing. For why would, we, why would we not go to Lazarus now? And there's a reason to despair because I don't want Lazarus to get more sick. Yet Christ has already shown me that I should not be held to grounded possibilities. He'll be able to heal Lazarus from this illness. And maybe better said, I trust 
I trust that Jesus will be able to heal him from this illness. And now that it's been two days, we are being told we're going to Judea. And we arrive. And Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. I'm trying to rack my head around it. I'm questioning Jesus. Wasn't this preventable? Wasn't this death preventable? Despair overcomes me. For death has arrived. Death has come to Lazarus. How could this be overcome? The healing of a blind man, yes, has shaken me when I recognize the resurrective power of Christ to restore sight. But overcoming death? How is the flourishing of life even possible? I attempt to console Mary and Martha, and I'm frustrated. I'm so frustrated at the despair I face, for death has arrived. And when I step out of our passage, I realize why I'm frustrated. Yes, I question in my heart, Jesus, wasn't this preventable? It's a close question to my heart, and I wonder if it's a close question to your heart. We continue to see rising and breakthrough cases of COVID-19 in our country I really thought last summer we would be back to normal. That this coming September, we would have a large kickoff. And I hear from our families, the anxiety that arises in thinking of school this fall. Will their children be safe? The reasons to despair are so looming. They are palpable. Wasn't all of this preventable? Could not more have been done. Death has come. And couldn't it have been preventable? And this question looms larger in my heart when I see the chaos in Afghanistan. Jesus, wasn't this preventable? I pray for my siblings in Haiti when I see deaths have gone up. Couldn't the amount of death be preventable? In the largest question of mine, the code read, the effects of climate change have arrived. We have a small window to change and advocate for future generations to prevent unnecessary death. But even now, at this moment, this code read, Jesus, wasn't this preventable? Why bring up the ongoing pandemic, Afghanistan, Haiti, and climate change? Why name all the reasons to despair? For the reasons to despair seem legion. They are many. They are burdensome. They are exhausting. They have blocked my vision. For I cannot see how any restoration could arise from the grounded possibilities. The reasons to despair when death is looming and here has created an abyss that cannot be filled. The healing of a blind man is one thing, but death is final. How's flourishing of life even possible? For when I come to question Jesus, I realize that even if we had left when we received the news of Lazarus, it would have taken us two days to get there. We would still have arrived with Lazarus in the tomb for two days. But still, I still resonate with Martha. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. His illness... The reasons to despair, the embodiment of hope could have healed his illness as Jesus had done with the blind man. This was preventable if Jesus had been there. The things we face today are reasons to despair. My heart sighs with heaviness if only Jesus had been there. 
our faith tells us of the resurrection to come. And in the same way that Martha responds to Jesus, I know that he will rise again on the last day. We have come to Christ with our reasons to despair, the reasons that have created an abyss. And we have hope in the someday in the future, one that lies beyond. But that faith response of what lies ahead, it doesn't feel like it's meeting me, meeting us amid our despair. For how is the flourishing of life even possible? And then our text ends today with the words of Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they will die, will live. It's a promise. It's a promise of a new creation. It's a promise that is filled with the wonder of a new creation. But more importantly, like Martha, when we have come to Christ with our reasons to despair, with the abyss of death looming, our text ends not just with the promise of a new life, of a new creation. Our text today, our text today ends with the whom. Not with a reason to hope, but the embodiment of hope. Martha is not just met with a faith response that meets her despair, that meets her in her despair. Instead, it is a solidarity of Christ who is the resurrection and the life. And our reasons to despair that seem legion, they remain in our hearts and our minds for at times when we cannot see how restoration could be possible within the grounded possibilities of our lives today. When the abyss of despair is too large for a reason of hope to fill, how could Lazarus face restoration that day? How could we face restoration today when death is final? And for that reason, our text today ends where it's meant to end. For the word of God is calling to us. Our text ends not with the dismissal of the abyss of despair, not even with the resurrection of Lazarus, of grounded possibilities being broken apart. Not today. For the abyss of despair is met with the solidarity of Christ, with Martha and with us. It's the presence of Christ who sits with Martha, who sits with us, the embodiment of hope. For Jesus Christ, the presence of hope whispers to us, if we are to receive sight to see this word, I am the resurrection and the life. Is the flourishing of life possible? Do we have eyes to see and ears to hear the promise of a new creation? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.